let's start again with the uh, truly uh, outstanding uh, symposium on authors such as pivotal for our contemporary uh, identity as scholars and as students, um, Gramsci and Kant. This afternoon, we will have a session devoted to these correlations between uh, Kant and Gramsci on education and the connections between liberty and peace, the fact autonomy and peace. Um, my name is Nadur Binati. I teach at, here at Columbia Political Science, and I'm very pleased to chair this session. We'll have uh, three panelists and a commentator. Uh, so I will introduce two of them separately, and then the second round two others. Um, the first uh, to uh, present is uh, Professor Michael Vec Van T. Um, he teaches at Michigan and is the author of uh, a recent book, uh, which I need to go back to the title, it's fascinating, I didn't know about that. The Flying Field of Autonomy, Equality and Excellence in Modern Meritocracy. Today is presenting a paper uh, uh, titled Although There Must Be Force. Fostering autonomy in educational hierarchies then and now. Um, you have up now, uh, of, um, please. And then after, Elizabeth Ellis, uh, she teaches at Texas, AM uh, Texas, and she's also um, working on topics related to Kant and Kant philosophy. And she wrote recently. Uh, two books on Kant's politics and uh, provisional politics on arguments for political context in Kant. And she will present today uh, Fiat Justitia Ut Duret Mundus, rereading uh, re Kant's political thought. So, please. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, thank you, Gayatri, and everybody for inviting me here, um, it really has been fascinating. I won't talk very much about Gramsci. Uh, I teach Gramsci to undergraduates, but when it comes to Gramsci, I'm a total amateur, but I have to mention a um, couple of things. Um, when I was in college in the 1980s, um, winter 1987, I was introduced to Gramsci and fell in love with his idea. And then I went back, to, back home to Finland for the summer 1987, and uh, the, my other exposure to Gramsci came immediately that summer because the Soviet oil tanker named Antonio Gramsci uh, <laughs> shipwrecked in the Baltic. <laughs> and created the worst, worst environmental disaster in the Baltic ever. And there's some like multiple levels of deep irony is that a Soviet oil tanker creates an environmental disaster and it's called Antonio Gramsci. So, um, so it's been um, sort of an interesting uh, love uh, Hate, not love hate relationship with Gramsci, but the appropriation of his ideas. Uh, I wanted to mention one thing. Um, I liked it in the conference publicity. There's the one picture that of Kant that's good, but I thought that since I'm going to be talking to some extent about children, uh, I wanted to have a picture of um, the Immanuel Kant um, finger puppet uh, <laughs> purchased from the. Um, Unemployed Philosophers uh, Guild. So my, uh, my talk is very much in the spirit of uh, do not excuse, uh, uh, ex do not excuse, do not accuse, but use. So um, let me um, talk a little bit about a bunch of different things. So back in the early 1990s, uh, Barbara Herman boldly decided to consider whether it would be worth thinking about Kant when thinking about sex and marriage from a feminist perspective. Given that Kant regarded marriage as a contract to the exclusive use of your spouse's genitals and shared the easy misogyny of most of his fellow enlighteners, this was a bold move indeed. In the event, in the surprising event, we might say, Hermann ended up arguing that Kant's account was quite compatible with Andrea Dworkin's re-envisioning of gendered relationships from a radical feminist perspective. What I'm about to propose, using Kant as a theoretical resource for egalitarian and gender egalitarian conception of educational hierarchies is in the same seemingly foolish spirit, but significantly less radical. Sure, Kant's own account 
of child rearing and education endorses the school of hard knocks, hard bets. Hard bets make you strong, cuddling is a bad thing. And his focus is in many important ways on making men or boys with all the gender baggage you might imagine. But his educational theories are first very radical for his day and I'll suggest even for our day. And in his unease about having to acknowledge girls and women's agency, he gives us resources for thinking about what it might mean to be attentive to gender denials of autonomy. Negotiating the tension between force and freedom is, as Arthur Ripstein has recently put it, the key theme of Kant's political thought. It is also, as Kant himself put it, the key theme in any educational arrangement. One of the greatest problems of education is how to combine subjection to legitimate force with one's facility to exercise one's freedom. For there must be force. How do I cultivate freedom when there is constraint? I must accustom my pupil to put up with a constraint on his freedom and to direct him to use his freedom well. For Kant, education and politics are analogous. For example, he saw most people of his time as immature in civically significant ways, in need of something that would allow them to overcome their immaturity and become autonomous. While we need no longer share Kant's judgment about his contemporaries and so might reject the analogy between real and metaphorical immaturity, the tension Kant identified remains real both in politics generally and education in particular. Kant's ideas about how that tension can be solved, I argue, remain insightful sources for contemporary politics of education. I'll make three related points. First, I'll offer a slightly unusual reading of what autonomy means for Kant. Uh, the standard view of understands autonomy as capacity of persons usually to set their own ends, to self-authorize their actions. I won't deny this is an important aspect of autonomy, but I argue that Kant also thinks of autonomy as ascriptive, where someone to count as autonomous depends on whether someone else ascribes self-authorization to her. Second, Kant also thinks autonomy comes in degrees and kinds. A person to be a, can be autonomous in some practice and, and not in another, and it is possible for someone to be more or less autonomous in some one practice. These two ways of reconceiving Kantian autonomy help us conceptualize the space for political contestation. Someone might deny you autonomy as law denied women civic autonomy for a long time, for example, but you might be able to challenge such denials by showing how your autonomy in some other domain is in conflict with the denial in another. It may be possible even when the ascriptive denials of autonomy are the prevailing views of the day, even when we might say in a Grumpian spirit, they are hegemonic. I tease these ideas out of Kant's theory of education. I will be talking about actual practices of education both in Kant's time and in ours. And here then my third point today, Kant's anti-paternalistic negotiation between force and freedom can give us even, us, even us 21st century educators good tools for not only teaching better, uh, but also tools for recognizing the unavoidability of force that we exercise, whether we want it or not. A tiny bit of self-indulgent context. For some years, I've been trying to read Kant as a social theorist of sorts. Unlike some latter-day Kantians in the Anglophone analytic tradition, which is my tradition, I see him as far less as an ideal theorist than as a theorist attentive to the two seemingly incompatible registers of social action. Reasons and ideas on the one hand, and empirical motives and interests on the other. I have also been trying to apply this kind of analytic Kantian social theory to real world black practices. Lately, my interest has been increasingly in education. This is partly because of my very concrete practical interest in teaching political theory better. It is also partly because I've gotten involved in projects aimed at improving our own academic climate, particularly in terms of gender, race, and sexual orientation. Continuing problems about, say, women in many academic disciplines, the Levy pipeline, where the proportion of women diminishes the higher we move in hierarchies, for example, remain real. They are also, in some ways, epistemically harder than even 20 years ago. Stylizing things a bit, back then, the problem were powerful Neanderthals with explicitly sexist and racist and homophobic attitudes. The cultural consensus has changed significantly, and the majority of people seem sincerely committed to equality. Yet there are problems. So that's a context. Uh, now, Kant on education and autonomy, or how do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> practice, 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 not go down the street. A uh, quick precis on Kant's educational theory. 
Although Kant was influenced by every Enlightener's favorite philosophers of education, Locke and Rousseau, he draws even more heavily from the ideas of a radical German educational reformer, Johann Bernhard Basedow. In Basedow's, and so also in Kant's thinking, educational reforms had to happen at several levels. There had to be changes to the way education was provided at the infrastructural level. It was to be moved away from the church to the hands of the state, and it was to be more comprehensive and accessible than it had ever been before. All children, according to Basedow and his followers, were to be educated on relatively equal terms. In terms of instruction at the level of the classroom and individual students, Basedow and Kant had radical ideas too. They opposed rote memorization in favor of practice-based learning that emphasized play. They explicitly banned physical punishment, but they did stress the value of physical exercise and physical play. In general, the idea was that learning should happen largely on the pupil's terms, level appropriately, we might now call it. Children were to do things they liked to do, and their tasks should be ones that were challenging, but interesting, and most importantly, ultimately doable. Children should also not be made to do things they could not yet even conceive. Religious education should only begin when there was any meaningful chance for them to understand religious concepts. So, physical play on children's terms rather than the memorization of unintelligible phrases, for example. At the same time, Kant was particularly opposed to teaching methods that held children back, that underestimated them. His logic applied from, from the rearing of very small children to schooling, and we might consider what, what he thought about prevailing methods of che teaching children to walk. A common early modern way was to use walking cars <coughs> and leading strings that prevented toddlers from falling down. The theory was that the children would hurt themselves if they fell. Kant thought this was foolish. In general, it would be better to use fewer instruments right from the start and just let the children learn more things by themselves. That way, they would learn things more thoroughly. In other words, they should learn self-direction. So there's a way in which autonomy, understood as self-direction, begins physically. Our control of our own bodies is the first kind of agentic autonomous <coughs> action we exercise. But the same logic goes for non-corporeal autonomy. The exercise of judgment, as opposed to unexercised knowledge, is a test of our cognitive self-direction, we might say. Or more simply, exercising judgment is a key part of what it means to be a person, as opposed to an automaton. And judgment, Kant tells us in the first critique, cannot be taught but only practiced. So, so far, I've only talked about autonomy as a capacity for self-direction, the familiar view. Um, we might notice already, though, that Kant is thinking about children as autonomous in some way, and to some extent, broadens our conception. Self-direction can mean different kinds of things. But now I want to turn to an even more radical conception of autonomy, ascriptive autonomy. One implication of what we've seen is that it matters how educators think about those who are to be educated. If you think that your student can't exercise self-direction, you likely won't assign her tasks that call for such practice. And by the way, think about our concept, the word exercise. It means two different kinds of things, in, certainly in English and in German, which I know. She might actually be able to do more than what you think she can. So educators' mistaken conception can foster a bad educational practice. And I would argue, though not today, that we still make those mistakes pretty much every day even on our own university campuses. But this kind of mistake can be causally sticky more broadly than to any given student. It's because educators not only can affect practices, but meanings and understanding. So if someone in general is treated as an incapable of self-direction, then in some important way, it doesn't matter what she can actually do. She's not going to be able to exercise her self-direction. Well, that's what I'll claim. The concept of immaturity that we know so well from Kant's What is Enlightenment is also a real legal category, uh, meaning minority. I suggest that we treat it both as a legal category and as a metaphor for lack of autonomy. So maturity, Mündigkeit, is then a metaphor for autonomy. Kant's facile misogyny is pretty familiar, but in his various discussions of anthropology, what he says about women is actually uh, some sort of cognitive dissonance for him. And he does what we generally do when we suffer from cognitive dissonance, he starts joking. First, Kant says that women are legally immature. 
However, given the nature of her sex, a woman is so good at mouthing off uh, <coughs> that she can represent her and her husband's interests, even legally. So much so, in fact, that she might be called overmature. This is Kant's bad jocular play with the supposed but mistaken etymology of the term Mündigkeit, which has to do with Mao. Women can't really defend their property rights legally, even though they may own property. He says, just as they can be drafted into military service. This peculiar combination of de facto capacity and de jure incapacity, Kant suggests, may nevertheless lead women to have quite a bit of domestic power. Their sharp tongue makes them good at ordering at least their husbands around, but their legal immaturity also at the same time makes, them, uh, makes their husbands the guardians of the women's honor. It's a tiresome old joke to claim that women hold the real power in a household, but the way Kant uses the joke gives us purchase on his views about different dimensions of maturity, autonomy. Part of what's going on here is simply a familiar attempt to naturalize women's legal subjection under their husband's guardianship. There's a tension in Kant's reasoning, partly because he tends to believe that women are naturally inferior to men, while he also rejects the straightforward normativity of the natural. That he holds such views on women is not surprising, nor is it surprising that the beliefs led him to semantic and intellectual confusions. The confusion is fruitful for our analysis. Consider Kant's lectures on anthropology, where we also encounter this promising confusion. Men regard women as immature, he says, in one set of lectures, but the reason for this lies in part in women's nature. Kant thinks women are naturally good at instrumental rationality, but require the support of manly understanding to set ends. <coughs> the key here is that he doesn't think women's immaturity is completely natural. So here's Kant again. There is also a minority on the basis of sex. A certain, insights, uh, certain insights and affairs are quite beyond women's sphere. Women are not allowed to use their own reason, but instead must subject themselves to someone else's reason for discussions. When something becomes public, they must trust someone else's reason. In children, immaturity is natural. We call such a trustee of a woman her guardian. The emphasis is mine. The syntax of the end of the second sentence is strange. Since the passage is from a student's lecture notes, we might assume the point after the semicolon is a specification of the previous point, not a different point. That and the modality of Kant's verbs suggest that he's not talking about what women naturally can or cannot do, but of normative <coughs> matter, of what women may do. In other words, sometimes the question of whether you are an autonomous or not depends on whether you count as being autonomous. That is, it depends on whether someone ascribes self-direction to you or not. When that someone is powerful enough to make the ascription stick, as in the case where women are made immature by law, there are some domains in which some people may simply remain non-autonomous. Or to use a different language, they might remain subalterns. So, the idea of ascriptive autonomy is politically promising and politically fraught. Kant is aware of this. Right after the jocular discussion of women's autonomy in the anthropology, Kant returns to themes that echo, though, though oddly, the essay, What is Enlightenment, from, from more than 15 years earlier. But to make oneself immature, however degrading it might be, is nevertheless very comfortable. So that sounds like what is enlightenment. Naturally, leaders do not fail to notice this facility of the masses, and they take advantage of it, as it is difficult for the masses to unite themselves, especially since they know that letting people use their own understanding without the guidance of others is very dangerous, even deadly. State leaders call themselves the fathers of the country because they understand better than their subjects themselves how to make the subjects happy. The people, however, are condemned to permanent immaturity with regard to their own good. If we took this at face value, it would seem inconsistent with the earlier essay but it's quite clear from the discussion and the context that Kant is being totally sarcastic. He particularly dislikes rulers calling themselves the fathers of their nations. The sarcasm makes it clear that Kant sees this as an abuse of ascriptive autonomy. Although ascription cannot, in theory, uh, depend on any specific will, its being a question of interpretation means, in practice, that actual human beings do the interpret. The powerful, like the ruler, rulers in Kant's example, 
often present themselves as the legitimate interpreter. They try to make their power seem like authority, that is, recognize legitimate standing. But their claims often serve altogether too conveniently paternalistic and conservative desires about status quo, and worst of all, risk becoming permanent constraints on some people. And so Kant urges us to be skeptical every time someone powerful calls another person immature. There's a principle reason. Even though autonomy is descriptive, it is still a matter of reasons, not just of power. Here, then, we might return to the question of force. When it comes to the education of children, the need to reconcile force and freedom is more conspicuously obvious than elsewhere. While there are disagreements on when children become sufficiently mature to govern themselves and in which domains they are to govern themselves, uh, there does seem to be white agreement that in some matters, parents know best and therefore probably are allowed to ignore the children's will. This doesn't, of course, mean that any kind of force is legitimate. But even when we think that those who are to be educated are at least formally adults, as they generally are at universities, the people we teach, for example, the very premise of education involves force. The question is what kind of force and whether it is acknowledged. Consider this true story. In most North American doctoral programs, graduate students have to pass a set of exams, usually called freedoms or general so comprehensive. They are an important gateway between coursework and the independent dissertation process. Some years ago, a graduate student asked a colleague of mine whether her prelim exam, what her prelim exam was going to be like. In my department, part of the exam is oral. The student is questioned uh, for some hours by four professors. My colleague told the student to think of the occasion as a friendly conversation among intellectual peers. How's a hefty dose of bad faith? The prelim is an event which determines whether the student gets to continue in a program. The people judging the student are above her both in an institutional and intellectual hierarchy because they are seen as competent judges in whether the student knows her material. So it cannot be, by definition, a conversation among peers. And for that very reason, in my experience at least, the students seldom experience it as a particularly friendly one. I have used this example for several reasons. First, the very premise of education is hierarchy. Uh, the students are in your course because you are better than they are in the subject you teach. A hierarchy of competences, of course, need not mean a hierarchy of any other kind. You can be more competent than a social or moral equal in one domain, but even if she wants your tuition in that domain, she doesn't become your inferior. Your students, whether children or adults, are to some extent subject to your orders, but the range of what those orders are is very limited. You can require that they write free papers, for example, but you can't require that they come shovel your sidewalks or babysit your children. And in fact, you can even teach social superiors as all those kids who teach their parents to text on their cell phone constantly do. These hierarchies neither presuppose nor entail force, especially in a context where the students are legal adults. At the theoretical level, we are dealing with the familiar distinction between power and authority. You might be interested in learning from me because of my epistemic authority, and that authority it was creates both your desire and then the intellectual hierarchy. But the hierarchy is not based on power. In a way, the education of autonomous agents involves a contingent pro canto hierarchy and is based as befits a liberal democratic sensibility on the consent, consent of those to be educated. Students might not have full voice to use a Hirschmannian distinction, but they do have exit options. From the ground up, however, things can look very different as my anecdote about the prelim suggests. In fact, partly because education involves an intellectual hierarchy, students often have a difficulty experiencing structures and constraints they face as anything other than arbitrary exercises of force. The key, one might suggest in a Kantian spirit, would be to be sufficiently attentive to the student's actual competences so that the constraints are intelligible to her on her terms. The worst thing an instructor can do are, one, to couch the for use of force in a language of well-meaning paternalism. Oh, you'll see in a couple of years why this was really good for you. Two, deny the fact of force, as my colleague did about the prelim. And three, to do away with the constraint uh, entirely. All are pragmatic descriptions of autonomy or denials of autonomy that they result from cluelessness as they do these days, rather than from ill will or sexism or uh, racism or, or conscious or explicit racism, racism 
doesn't make much, them much better, and it makes them much harder to see. So, a couple of final points. Power and authority do blur in the real world, and power can therefore mean that some persons are indeed made of immature. If I have the power of interpretation in some context, because, say, educated men are thought to know what they're talking about, then my belief that you cannot be autonomous deprives you of autonomy. It's not just whether you dare to think for yourself or complacently, lazily, let me do your thinking for you. I can simply stipulate that you cannot think for your child, yourself. Children don't know what's good for them, though they actually may. Women can't do math, though we know they do. They can't. If enough people believe me or share my way of thinking, then nothing that goes on in your mind can effectively counter it. Fortunately, such attempts do not always succeed. The claims of people's immaturity may be too implausible to take seriously. As history bears out, the possibility of some ascription schemes can erode over time. It took a long time for the idea of women's capacity for full autonomous agency to win almost universal acceptance, but it more or less has. The same is true for many other groups that were ideologically infantilized. Just consider the racialist ideologies of Europeans that they ent entertained about non-white people. The forms of racism that sexism that see non-white people and women as sorts of children are difficult to sustain in a world where Barack Obama is the president of the US. This is not to say that the problems have gone away or to celebrate some kind of easy end of history, uh, but it does make a difference. And one way of interpreting these histories is to see them as sets of challenges to types of ascription. Women and non-white people rejected their own infantilization by pointing out the ways in which they could be autonomous and were in fact treated as capable of thinking for themselves even when that capacity was officially denied. The point isn't that there's some unequivocal fact of the matter about whether someone really is or can be fully autonomous, or even less, that we are at some happy end of history. Things are always, to some extent, ambiguous and contingent. Power and authority unavoidably blur around the edges, and it's an open question whether autonomy in one dimension is reasonable grounds for ascribing autonomy in another. Thank you. Thank you.